What's up, world? You're tuned in to Power214.com. This is your boy Frankie, and you're listening to another episode of the World Famous Man Lounge. Uh, unfortunately, that dude is not here yet. Uh, that dude is having some vehicle problems, but that's not an issue. That's not an issue. As you know, the Man Lounge is proudly sponsored by DSRRBusRental.com. That's right, if you're traveling to Dominican, if you need activities, if you got a group, if you need transportation, whatever you need, Rosario can take care of it. Give him a shout, 717-589-8406. Hey, man, coming off a, a great episode last week. We got a lot of things going on in the world today, but today I'm very proud to have in the Man Lounge a new Man Lounge member. We're going to give it up right now. Brother Michael Burke. What's going on? He is a author, consultant, and a motivational speaker. I'm glad to have you here, man. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad you reached out. Um, I can't wait to jump in some of these topics that we were talking about today, man. Definitely. I, I don't know what's going to happen. Somebody somebody may feel kind of that, that way today. Somebody, Uh-oh. <laughs> somebody going to feel it out there. I don't know who you are, but somebody's going to feel it out there. Well, if you feel that way today, man, make sure you let us know about it. You can always call us in the Man Lounge. Today's another Feel Good Friday. You can just hit us up and let us know what you're feeling good about. 469-759-7797. Once again, that's 469-759-7797. Want to give a special shout out to my frat brother Michael Willis out there in Chicago, who's down in Dominican Republic right now. I know you're hosting your uh, sixth annual uh, Christmas in October. You guys had your uh, icebreaker last night, meet and greet, if you will, at Blue Ice. Uh, y'all was doing your thing over there, so uh, wish you best luck with that. I know y'all are having a good time down there. I know some other brothers will be joining you here pretty soon. Uh, man, just a lot going on, Mike. When I say there's a lot going on, bro, there's a lot going on, man. People out here talking real crazy these days, man. Crazy and reckless. But before we get into all that, man, you know, part of what the Man Lounge is about is connecting the community to resources and vice versa. And you're definitely a resource in the community. So I want you to tell people about your conference that you have coming up, uh, what people can expect from the conference, what they can take away from it. Uh, Talk to us about what you got going on with that. So the Real Advantage Conference was birthed because um, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs – in, in the space, in the Dallas, Mount Fort Worth area, particularly, don't know what it takes to have an advantage or use their advantage to get inside a, a, a space where they're doing their business on a high level. Correct. So I brought in some guys um, who were close to me um, who are going to give people practical stuff. Now, I hate conferences where you go to yeah. and you come out of there hyped up, yeah. but you ain't got nothing to take home with you. So you just, Or you got to go subscribe to a bunch of stuff to absolutely. actually get to the content. I told of- every guy that was in there that this is not about subscription. This ain't about somebody buying a service from you. Mm-hmm. I need people to pay for this, come in, and walk out with actual tools that will take their business to the next level in the next three to six, uh, three to six months. Feel unfulfilled. Yep, so we got, uh, I got m- myself, I'm going to be doing a lot of business development talks um, and workshop on that level. I have a friend who's coming in doing leadership development on a real high scale, show you how to use your talents mm-hmm. to get you an advantage in the workspace or in the entrepreneur space. I have a gentleman by the name of Jay Mamie who's going to be coming out and talking about how to use your brand and elevate yourself inside of your influence. Mm-hmm. I got a guy by the name of Chris Fisher who's going to be coming in and talking about high-level... He's a Man Lounge member. You know Fish done been here. Fish, Fish the Mogul. Fish, my Shout man, out to bro. Fish the Mogul. Fish the Mogul, man. Yeah, he's going to be talking about some high-level um, financial stuff that's going to help people take their... Yeah, products. his Wealth and Whiskey series. Oh, yeah. yeah Wealth yeah. and Whiskey talk's been crazy, man. We've yeah. been learning a lot of he stuff. He came on here those, to promote man. that out. And uh, just so those that know, man, I met Brother Michael uh, Burks uh, during Next Fest. That was my yeah. second year involved with Next Fest. Man. And so uh, during Next Fest, you know, I, uh, they, the way we had it set up, you were in the, uh, not the VIP room, but we we purposely created that room to be like a social yeah. area where people would mix and mingle and kind of be forced to interact yeah. with each other. Yeah. And so it was purposely designed that way. I and uh, a, we put a, a couple of influencers game. like yourself in there, <laughs> uh, which, which is a great thing, man, because what as much access as people have now through social media um, – they also end up accessing content that's that's worthless. Yep. Yeah. It's it's an overload of worthless content that goes on out there. My my coach told me one time, you got to stop stop becoming uh, uh what is it constipated with information. Correct. Right. You consuming everybody. You consuming these guys like E. T. Grant Car- Grant Cardone, Ty Lopez. Mm-hmm. You know all these guys, and you ain't doing nothing with the information nothing. that you're doing. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And it, just to talk about entrepreneurship real quick. Like, it took us, what, I did that two years, maybe okay. three years ago, 
and we're just now connecting. Yeah, what was on that? Seventeen. Yeah. yeah, seventeen. We're just now connecting on a professional level, yeah. developing relationships, and and being memorable enough to where somebody be like, "Yo, you know what? I remember this person. Yeah, I'd like to work with him." Me and you haven't talked since that day. Correct. And we had a couple. Uh, well, of texts. I'll say we we text and then we followed up, but. Paths have been going yo, yo, opposite direction. Busy, I stuff. think I got into, I started doing entertainment, so I started uh, managing some comedians and a few music, uh, musicians whole booking. Whole other route than what, we <laughs> than what we were whole talking about. Whole route than what he was talking about. When he was talking about me, I, it was some next level bit, the biz, biz yeah. stuff on the commercial level. But and then, then, it, like and then I flipped it to uh, pushing a speaker series, so yeah. I was working with a couple of clients on that. And then more recently, uh, I've had some talks possibly going in another direction before mm. the end of this year that'll set me up through this 2023. Man, you know, so. I'm going to stick close to him now. I'm gonna, I thought I was doing so. I'm going to stick close to him. After I do the conference, please believe you won't see Mike Burks for a hey. while. you see him next to this guy. Man, this, but this is what I learned because I've only been on social media since August, and that's actually where I reconnected with you guys because I saw the, yeah. the thing on there, and I was like, yo, I know that dude. Like, I need to reach out to him. <laughs> And so when you talked about being memorable, man, one of the things that we do is we like to tell the story in the background. So tell people about where you're from, yeah. uh, what you're doing currently with your company. I know I, I gave you a high level deal, but yeah. talk about some projects and things that you got going on outside of the conference, what you do with your company. Man, I am a humble kid from Chicago, Illinois, man. Um, grew up, you know, the ma- the stuff that you hear about. Mm-hmm. Drug infested home, alcohol abuse, child abuse, parent- parental abuse. Anything that you think of that should be shouldn't be going on in the household, that's what the environment I grew up in. Okay. And I always had other people outside the environment look at me and say, "You're you're going to be great." Yeah. And I always pushed it aside because, well, I'm a Chicago kid. I'm a little thug. I'm doing my thing. Yeah. I, I know I'm gonna be great. You know, I, I get it. I'm gonna be great on the court, or I'm gonna be great in these streets and with these bags <laughs> in my pocket. Yeah. Or something. But, I got you. Um, over time, people showed me different things, uh, and the the space where my life changes when my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother, right before she passed, she had a conversation with me. She said, you need to get away from people who are holding you down so that you can be the person that you're meant to be because I see it in you. Yeah. And I did what she told me to do. You know what I mean? There was a more specific conversation. But I did what I told, she told me to do, and my life started elevating from there and the people around me and everything like that. So now I went from being 15 years in information technology, doing everything from break fix to consulting on my own with major companies like you know Barclays Capital and all these guys. Mm-hmm to now doing consulting on my own business development, profit management, um, leadership development, things of that sort. So right now uh, I'm heavy on two things. One, helping people build businesses, Mm -hmm. and two, helping professional athletes um, cut through the stigma of mental health and create things off on and off off the court. Okay. Um, I'm currently working on some deals right now that I'm trying to work through. Uh, These guys go through a lot of stuff, bro. Um, you know, the, the, the separation anxiety, the oh, yeah. anxiety, all the stuff. And the only reason I got into it is because last year, 2017, I got diagnosed with anxiety. Okay. Severe anxiety. I had an anxiety attack while I was in San Diego, and um, it kind of, it almost took me out. So I have a one-year player development with Kansas City Royals. Nice. Uh, working with them off of the field, working with the high, uh, high school athletes that were drafted. Yeah. Uh, and then for about nine years, I was a senior associate uh, athletic director at Delaware State. Oh, yeah. So I understand what uh, student athletes go through uh, yep. off the field, on the field. Yep. Uh, I'm a coach at heart. Yeah. Uh, I used to be on the field. And then, uh, long story short, we ended up getting fired one year. We, <laughs> we were predicted in preseason, bro, to, to be number 10. Okay. Uh, this particular year, I want to say it was 2007. Uh, Delaware State Hornets. Uh, yeah, 2007 it would have oh. been because we won the championship in 2008. So in 2007, we, we weren't even on the radar. We finished the last game of the season. We ended up losing to Howard. They were like 0-9. We lose to Howard, so they end up 1-9. And, uh, and if we had won that game, we would have been co-champs. Okay. Well, that Monday, Coach walks in and decides to fire everybody. What? And after from that day forward, I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I want to be Coach's boss. True. So True. I went from being a kinesiology major to a sport management major and then end up getting my master's in sports administration oh, with you. concentration in leadership development. This guy. This guy, man. <laughs> and so what my, doesn't he do? My junior year in college, yeah. I was appointed as interim senior associate athletic director and literally the dean of my college calls over to the athletic director like, what the hell are you doing? This dude's still a student. What? 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, he was like, listen, this dude wrote the standard operating procedure manual for 17 sports. Our revenues are going up. I took it on as a project. Yeah. yeah. So I- I'm telling the story because you told a similar story about your upbringing. And uh, I experienced a lot of the same things because of where I was from, being yeah. in New Jersey, coming here, uh, transplanting to Dallas, coming here to Dallas, not feeling accepted because I was feeling like the East Coast kid. Yeah. So I was having a lot of problems at school. Yeah. I was acting out. I spent yeah. a couple hundred days they in treat, ISS. You know what I'm saying? They treat our East It's a lot different. They treat yeah. us different, man. And so uh, when I ended up finding out about sports and connecting with sports yeah. and, and having that release, well, that, that curbed my behavior in the classroom. Nice. I was part of that generation down here in Dallas that was a no pass, no play. That was one, I was one yeah. of the first generations. Yeah. So yeah, now you're telling me I'm, if my behavior in the classroom, I got to have it up to par in order for me to play on the field. Boom. So but I was good. you counteracting it. You know what nah. I mean? That's the part that I don't like, you know, even for the professional athletes. You know, you tell yeah. me that, you know, you need me to manage my anxiety, manage my feelings, do all this on, on the court for you, jump, shoot, whatever the case may be. Yeah. But at the same time, you give me no resources to manage it. And if I do take it, the crazy part is the medicine, bro. So the medicine they gave me, they gave me a warning and said, don't take it all, all the time. Only mm-hmm. take it when you need it mm-hmm. because it's addictive. Mm-hmm. So now you give me a but drug. But how do you know when you need it? That's exactly, you know what I mean? So now if it's an addictive drug that's supposed to be helping me with my anxiety, I'm trying not to use it so much. But when I do use it yeah. and I use it too much, now you're going to find me for being on some type of drug or anything like yeah. that. So it's a, it's a win-win for the league a lot of times. And I'm trying to see if we can fight that mental health issue on a different level, man. So maybe one day me and you can partner up and see what that look like. Hey, and, and if you just tuned in, your power, you're tuned in to power214.com. You're listening to Frankie and that dude on, on the man lounge. And we're sitting here chopping it up with brother Michael Burke and talking about mental health around student athletes and professional athletes. Uh, to dive into it even even more, uh, just about two weeks ago, we had an NFL agent on, Brother uh, Ron Hawthorne, out there in Philadelphia. Yep. He was helping uh, educate people about the pay-for-play bill that just passed in California. Yep. Now, when we talk about mental health, though, I'll, I'll ask you a question because, you know, we want to be transparent on this platform. Absolutely. If an athlete is already being paid X amount of dollars, are you looking at it from employer-sponsored insurance, or should this be something that athletes should be looking to invest in themselves for long-term care? Because at the end of the day, the employer's responsibility is only but so much. Yep. You see what I'm saying? I get you, yeah. And so... I think ownership is the biggest part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Take ownership of your life in every way. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't, the league, whichever one it is, will take ownership of your life. Correct. Because you're, you're a commodity to them. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you're an asset. You're someone who can come in, bring in the numbers, bring in the, uh, the fans, all that stuff. When it comes down to your mental health, when it comes down to your financial health, your relational health, and your business health, all those things, I think you should take ownership of it and mm-hmm. be like, okay, I need to put a plan in place, some contingencies, some people that care about me that's going to be able to put me in the right uh, space, yeah. right? And, that, and that's... I, that's the space that I think that they don't understand because they have so many yes people around them because they're getting paid that they're like, no, just do this. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And it never gets taken care of. And then you get an Antonio Brown. Yeah. You, and, and that's that's who I was going to refer to is there were some things that Antonio Brown has said early on when he was dealing with his helmet situation that really wasn't a helmet situation. Yeah. Uh, we had brother um, Damian Robinson. He yeah. played with the Jets yeah, in Tampa Bay. Yeah, yeah. So Damien was here, and he was telling us, you know, while we on the outside looked at it as this dude is being stubborn trying to get a helmet, he was actually bringing uh, exposure to an area that was going to land him a sponsorship deal. And then subsequently his actions behind that got that deal canceled. But he eventually did get a deal with Zenith on a new helmet. Yeah. So I understood um, the tactics behind that. But the comments that I that I found troubling when it came to Antonio Brown was he was referencing that uh, he basically was unhappy in, in Oakland because the system had failed him. Yeah. Now, I, if you're saying that, and this is Antonio Brown's words, yeah. the system had failed him, how do you leave Oakland or want to leave Oakland and then go to New England, who is nothing but <laughs> the exemplary? Exactly. Uh, you know, yeah, they, yeah. They, they, they are the system. They created what is the system, exactly. you know? Exactly. And the, the, the back end of that is, you know, I want to change the system. I want to get out of it. Y'all tripping, y'all giving me all this problem, but I still got to get paid. Yeah. Because the only thing I know is to catch this ball. Yeah. You know what I mean? Which he can do at a high level still yeah, right now. Right, right now. Even if somebody wanted to take the chance on him, he can come in and still do it. But And I think the door might be back open for him because one of those lawsuits, that sexual lawsuit, the number two yep. one that came on, has yep. been dismissed. Yep. 
uh, she dropped it. Yep. So that's that, that's an eye opener to be like, okay. Well, that sounds like his agent it. finally fucking woke up and was like, <laughs> let me let me get this dude yeah. out of this hot water. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm thinking I'm thinking he may get another chance. It may be next year. Yeah. It may be towards the end of this year. Who knows? Man, there's a lot of teams I could use him this year. I would love to have him. Let me tell. You're, you're a Cowboy me. fan? No, no, no. So the Chicago Bears. Excuse me. Um, if we can get Antonio Brown. Or or maybe even uh, some of the other people out here. Colin Kaepernick. We need a quarterback. So we can get Come Colin on, Kaepernick. Come on, man. Mitchell Trubisky's out there. What do no, you no, mean? No, 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 no. I, Mitch, I love you. You've been doing okay. But we need something that's going to take us to the, uh, to y'all the Super had Bowl. A, y'all have had a big drop-off. I mean, we're definitely getting into sports. But y'all have had a big drop-off from last year's offense production. <laughs> now, let, let me make it clear. I'm a Giant fan. I, I, I live I in Dallas. I see. But my second love is Chicago because I worked with the yeah. Chicago Bears and Tony Medlin. Yeah. In the equipment department. Okay. So I was out there the years that uh, Matt Tank, no, Tank uh, Johnson was coming out oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, with the gun situation and all that. So we were out there uh, working with T-Med. Shout out to T-Med and, and Big O, uh, my, my, my mentor and advisor, Mark Springs. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to Chicago football in that atmosphere, man, there's a different type of cold in Chicago, bro. Yeah. Like I yeah. had coach from the East Coast <laughs> and, and my coach just got all disrespected. Yeah. So I ended yeah. up having to buy a coat while I was out there oh, yeah. right there off Michigan Ave, man. You, you feel the history. You feel the, that, that wind will the culture, your, your body, it man. Will speak, but your bones. If you're not, look, I've done that plenty of times thinking that like, all right, I'm going to jump off this plane. I'm coming from Dallas. The coach should be all right. I jump off the plane and get downtown. I'm like, yo, where is the nearest <laughs> store? I got to do it. Like, I went and got me a triple fat goose. Uh, yeah, uh, it's just, I think it's just made differently in Chicago. Because here, you know, you get a triple goose and it, it, it breaks the nah, wind. Nah, nah, it didn't do it out there. there you be like, wait a minute. And what so, are y'all talking about? Uh, a lot of the... I was only there for a few weeks. So T-Med took, brought me out there. I was learning a lot about the system. Uh, I was only supposed to be there two weeks, and then they ended up keeping me a few more weeks because yeah. he, he liked how I had worked. But while we are there, they did something uh, for the entire staff, so they took us to a steakhouse. One of the very first times where I actually had to sit down in a professional manner and, and really follow protocol, if you will, on how to eat with oh, a group yeah, with yeah. a group of other men. You yeah. know what I mean? Like. Yeah. It wasn't just uh, the homies going out. You you were seen as colleagues and employees, oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. it was just a different experience. And then it's it's different in that that corporate yeah because uh, you're being judged, yeah. you're being evaluated. Yeah, all the way down to how you order your food. Correct. You know what I mean, because they're like, yo, if what this fork guy you likes using? His food like that, then how does he treat his people? Exactly. You know what I mean. And a lot of people don't think on that high level. But you got to. Yeah, like when I shake people's hand. I, I, a man's hand got to give it that firm grip. It's not even just a firm grip. So somebody taught me this one time. This uh, this Caucasian guy who's a mentor to me. I can't say his name because he wants to stay uh, in the secret a lot. But um, he shook my hand one time and he showed me something in business. If a person can shake their hand and have your hand over their their hand over yours, it's a sign that domination you, domination and you feel beneath them. Yeah, you have to go in full on. Right, there, you know, even handed, mm-hmm. and hold your hand there to let him know this is this is where we are. We are equals. Yeah. A lot of people don't even notice that there are people like making you, and it's a subconscious thing that somebody can do it and make you feel small. If you notice, if you shake somebody's hand like that, they instantly scrounge a little bit, like or the this. shoulders come in, or they yeah, sink. They yeah. They feel little. Yeah. And you're able to manipulate the whole conversation at that point. And I've I've done it just to try it out, and I was like, yo, that's a Crazy and it works. It works in business, and they do it every day. And and I always encourage people, especially like sometimes I'll get people that are contact me and they want to do a consultation. Yeah. And I just keep it real, and I tell them you don't need me. You, you just have to dig a little deeper in yeah. what you want on your vision. Yeah. Because my thing is, if you can't articulate to me what you really want, is one you either haven't done your research, or two you really haven't put the right foundation together. Yeah. To stand on when I'm doing so in my coaching, not aware into that part. Yeah, so I can't I can't create your foundation. Yeah, I can't. You got to come to me with a foundation, and I can give you the parts to help build on top of that. So in my in my when I do tra- uh, breakthrough coaching, like mm-hmm. when I'm trying to help you get to the deepest part in the core of yourself. Um, I f- we first have to find out who you are. Mm-hmm. Then we find out, you know, what you do. Then we find out why you do it. And then that how that you came to me about, mm-hmm. then we can go through that. But unless you know who you are in here and in here, because if you ask most men, well, so who are you? They'll tell you, 
Ooh, excuse me. They'll tell you all this cool stuff about how they, you mm-hmm. know, I'm an entrepreneur. I made this much money. I didn't say what you do. Who are you? Who you are. Yeah. Who are you? And here and here. I'm a father. I'm a husband. <laughs> you know what I mean? I tell people that. Who are you? I'm a yeah. man of, I, me, I'm a man of principles and values who loves helping people no matter where they are in life. Yeah. How do I do that? Through coaching, speaking, uh, uh, consulting, and, and basically helping people take themselves from where they are, where they want to be. One of the things that I found myself doing uh, when I created my company was I found some information on the Internet that I found very interesting. And it was actually flipping the model of answering why first. That's what the Fortune 500 companies do. So when you when you work backwards from the why to the who, what and go on and on, you able to uh, reverse engineer your vision. Yeah. And then that all that's going to overflow to your marketing. That's yep. going to overflow to your branding and your advertising. Yep. And so yep. what I've learned to do is define why yep. in activities first. Because sometimes you'll find yourself just following the trend, not knowing you're following the trend. And that's and so that one right there, I use that model for people who are on a high level. Mm-hmm. For, but for people who just start out as an entrepreneur mm-hmm. and you ask them, most people don't know who they are, period. Correct. With outside of the business, outside of their job, outside of a husband, they don't know exactly as a personal mm-hmm. person, they don't know who they are. But if you're on a high level and you're making you're, you're making a little money, you, you, you know what you're trying to do with it, now we can reverse engineer the why you got into this and go and work backwards. I, I use that model for people who are high level thinkers. And you got to be able to drill down. Inch wide, mile deep. That's what I call yeah. it. So in my coaching, uh, we do inch, mile, wide deep. What's the inch? What's the thing that's plaguing you the most? Mm-hmm. And let's drill down all the way down the iceberg. Because a lot of times people don't see the thing that's bothering you the most is minute and small. Yeah. But it's so heavy up under the surface because it's so huge and all these things, these variables mm-hmm. are attached to it that you you don't see it. You're looking at the surface level of it. So stop looking at that surface level of the iceberg, that little piece that keeps bothering you, I need you to dive in under the water, look at how big the iceberg is, and find out the main three issues that are plaguing you that causes the one issue that's doggone uh, irritating you. But what if, what if you run into that client that says, hey, I'm, I'm good spiritually, emotionally, everything's good, I, I got, I'm motivated to work, uh, but I'm having a problem connecting my product and going to market. Do you do coaching around uh, being able to take small businesses and entrepreneurs to market? Yes, absolutely. So in that problem, we have four areas that we're going to look at. There's four P's in business that we can find out what the issue is. There's mm-hmm. people, product, profit, and I forgot the last one because I'm, I got a brain. <laughs> but y'all can go to IamMikeBurks.com forward slash coaching and I guarantee you'll find out exactly what I'm talking about. So there's, so if someone's talking about that high level stuff right there, mm-hmm. I have a few tools that I've learned from consulting with people like Bain and Company and mm-hmm. McKinney and stuff like that. That we find that issue we got, and a lot of it's reverse engineering. Correct. You know, a lot of it's like, all right, what's the initial issue? What what is the the disconnect? What's the gap? One one question I find that people fail to answer in business is why do I go into business? Am I going into business just to simply generate profit? Am I going into business to be consumed by a larger company and sell? Am I going into business to uh, create just a lifelong revenue stream and a yep. foundation for my family? And sometimes, especially with those newer ones, and when I say newer ones, you've been in in business five to ten years because. Yep. As an entrepreneur, five to ten years is still relatively new. It can take you five yeah. years alone just to build build the concepts of your brand. Um, yeah. But when it when it gets down to the nitty gritty and it, and you have to get out there and you find yourself on the grind and you find yourself chasing these dollars, a lot of times people haven't answered that, that question properly. Yeah, and I think I think it's because when you're chasing money. You, you forget about what the business was for, mm-hmm. right? And they, they forget that there's different there's different angles to go in when you first get into business. One, there's the exit strategy where you're exiting the business and you're probably just an advisor to the business at that point. You hire the CEO mm-hmm. and he's going to take over the business after you've got it to a point where it's running smoothly, mm-hmm. it's making profit, and you're able to exit properly. Then you have the business that you created to sell. You just want it's something that was on your heart. You wanted to create it, and now you're gonna sell it to somebody so you can move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And then there's that, that business that is your passion and your purpose, your your baby project that you're always gonna be a part of. And people don't. And those are the ones that I find with clients are the hardest ones to get them to position themselves to let go. Yeah, because they don't have an exit strategy. 
because they, they go in with the mind frame. And, and, and I'm making I'm statements, good. but I'm also wanting to pick your brain on yeah. it. Have you run into a lot of that? Like, Absolutely. And I call, them the, I call those the intermediate ones. Those are the ones that are at least doing six figures on the books. They feel good about where they're at, but they need a little more capital to really uh, push themselves to the next level you in the market. The problem with that is they're still, they still have a nine-to-five mentality. Mm-hmm. They really believe that that thing they created is going to be attached to them for the rest of their life. Yeah. Every idea that you have is not supposed to be attached to you for the rest of your life. Some of those ideas are meant to be relinquished into the world so they can benefit other people. And then propel you to your next project. To your next level. It might have been you that six figures, that six figures and a half, whatever that is, mm-hmm. was supposed to, you're supposed to take that and create the next thing that was supposed to elevate you to the next level. But because you're holding on to that security, mm-hmm. that, that money's coming in, you're, you're not willing to go back to step one again and recreate what's deeper inside of your heart. You mm-hmm. have to understand there are, they have, you have to teach them that, and it's back going back to that why. Why did you create this business? Correct. Oh, I created because I needed more money in the house and da da da. Okay, you but that, money but, now. And I was going to say that answer to that question will evolve and change. So yeah. you have to be willing to change you it. You got money now. So why do you, what are you going to do with the money? Mm-hmm. What's next? And I ask a lot of people, a lot of my guys who are like, you know, when we finish our coaching duration and I ask them what's next, mm-hmm. we usually go on to the next duration of coaching. Because when I asked them what's next, they'd be like, what do you mean? I was like, is this as far as you're going to go? Is mm. the only idea you have? Is the only thing you've ever written down that you said this is what you want to do? No. Okay, how many other ideas do you have? Yeah. And they'd be like, man, I really want to. Then we need to start over again. And see, I give, I give my shouts out to my mother. Shout out to my mother. She's not with us. Uh, rest in peace, Mama Libby, Libby Meredith. But she, at an early age, even in high school, she would put it on us to have put together five-year plans. Yeah. She knew for the next eight years through high school and through college, you know, I needed to have some organization. Yep. So whatever it was, brainstorming wise, we would just put it on paper. Yeah. And then we would drill down from there. And if we couldn't complete an action plan or we couldn't complete a five year plan with those goals, Mom was a beast. they just wasn't. Just and, wasn't and, and, and these are things that I picked up on because she strategically she used to be an English teacher. So uh, in literature, she used to just yeah. give us the books. But, you know, at that age, I'm like, who, who wants to read, my <laughs> Right? Really? Like, I'm, I'm sitting over here. I'm, I'm trying to kick it. And you gave me this book on yeah. uh, U.S. history. And, but and- I was fortunate enough to be around experienced businessmen yeah. uh, like my father and my uncle. Early on, they were entrepreneurs. They own real estate property. They, they own convenience stores. Wow. They did all those things to move on, to build houses, and, and, and to create a better lifestyle for us. And eventually, it brought us to, to Dallas, Texas. And so I credit that to that. But... But people don't, not everybody's fortunate enough to grow up with that. Yeah. Like I said, my mother was involved with I insurance, did, AIG. I, did, bro. I, I grew up around drug dealers, pimps, mm-hmm. drug alcoholics, all that stuff. There was not an entrepreneur or business owner in my space. Matter mm-hmm. of fact, my mom, I can't remember the last time she had a check paying job. She, my, I, I, The last time I remember having a check paying job is when I was maybe 12. Mm. And I'm 44, I'm 43 years old now. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was for years. I knew I, all I saw her was trying to hustle and, and get us to where we needed to be. So I never saw that that other side of it where yeah. people were getting up every day and working and ethics and all that other stuff. I had to look out into the world and find it. Yeah. And the crazy part is I found it in, in drug dealers. And and hold that thought, man, because we're we going to chime in and, yep. and we're going to chop it off about that. Hey, man, if you just tuned in, you're uh, listening to Power214.com, and it's the world-famous man lounge with Frankie and that dude. Uh, we're sitting here chopping it up with Brother Michael Burks, who is the author, consultant, motivational speaker, uh, just going over his background, his childhood coming up. Uh, I know we got some bills to pay. Uh, the Man Lounge is proudly sponsored by DSRR, uh, BusRental.com. That's right. If you're headed down to the Dominican Republic, like my boys Mike Willis and the Dominican Travel Group that, that's going down there for Halloween, you need transportation, you need act, act, activities. Uh, man, you need hotels. Call Rosario, 717-589-8406.